Hey everybody! <clears throat> wow, start off uh, froggy here. <clears throat> hey everybody, let me phrase that again. <laughs> okay, welcome to the uh, February uh, second Tuesday live stream. Um, I've got a couple of very noisy cats in the background there. So if you hear lots of meowing, that's not me, that's the cats. Um, <laughs> it has been a snowy day today. Um, in Michigan, we normally get a lot of snow, and this year, being uh, El Nino, we haven't got a lot, gotten a lot of snow, so it was really nice to have it coming down today. Um, so I've spent the day kind of daydreaming out the window quite a bit. Lovely day, though. Really, really appreciate having the snow. Um, this is Shamrock Fields. So tonight, we are going to be working on depth. A couple of months ago in December, we worked on dimension and I talked about how depth and dimension are two different things. So back, sorry, you can go back and watch the poinsettia lesson. Um, that one was super long because the image was um, a little bit more complex than I think I normally want to do. Um, but yeah, that is the lesson on dimension. And then tonight is kind of corresponding with that. Um, hopefully we take things a little bit more casual and simpler with the depth, less, depth lesson than we did with the dimension because, wow, that poinsettia was, that was biting off a lot of stuff to work with. Um, okay, so here we go. Let me see. The sketchbook that I am working out of tonight is the Stillman and Burn. I saved the label and I keep this in a drawer where it doesn't get all crunched and crumbled. Um, I do, I, I save it just for this live stream so that, because it really does help to see the label of what I'm using. If you want more information in that, scroll all the way up to the top of the chat where I have pinned a resource page. And that resource page has more information about the Zeta series and where to find it. Um, there's a couple of affiliate links, which I would love for you to use. Um, but shop around, find the best price because marker is not a cheap hobby. So if you can catch them on sale, I have not looked for them. It's been, it's been ages since I've been in a Hobby Lobby or a Michaels. I live out in the middle of nowhere. So it is a 50 minute drive to get to one of those stores. So I haven't been to one in a really long time. Um, but when I was going to those stores more frequently, I don't remember seeing Stillman and Burn at the stores. So it could be that your best bet is to order from Blick or Amazon. But um, I've explained it in other live streams um, and on the website in articles. But just a really quick summary, markers like toothless, smooth paper. They like paper that is very slow to dry. Um, so that's what markers like. Colored pencils, on the other hand, they like a toothy paper, something that has a little texture to it, which tends to be overly absorbent for pencils. So it's really hard to find a paper that's right in that happy medium place where the markers work, but so do the colored pencils. So when I do find a product that works for me, I tend to use it a lot. And the Zeta series is one um, that I really do favor quite a bit. Stillman and Burn. And because I'm a left-hander, I like the spiral bound because I can turn it up this way or I can do it backwards like a Leonardo da Vinci kind of thing because um, spiral bound is tough um, when you use it front to back for lefties. But I like to be able to flip the pages and um, get those out of my way. It just kind of helps when you get that wrist hanging over the edge there. But the same journal is available in different sizes. And it's also, um, actually, I think I have one here. It is available with a, um, a the book binding. So yeah, Stillman and Burn, there it is. So that's the back cover. And this has more of um, the folio type. So Whichever binding you like, they come in both, um, same paper in both, so um, super handy. And I will always be working on this smaller size here for, um, for these projects. But you know, the digital stamp that I create is hard to print into a journal. So I'm really curious what you are doing. Um, as far as what you're doing with the digital stamps, are you working in a journal? 
Are you tracing the digital stamps into the journal? How are you working? Um, let me know about that in the comments. I do read through those comments. Um, I kind of skim through them during the stream, but I will read through them afterwards. And I learn so much, so many things about, you know, how you guys are working and what you're working with. And I can answer questions um, when I see those over there. Um, let's see, Evie Mel is asking, is there an affiliate link on your site? The YouTube links don't always work for me. I want you to get credit. Yes, go to the resource page and scroll all the way down to the bottom and there's a list of supplies with affiliate links for all of the markers that we'll be using tonight, all of the colored, well, I will add all the colored pencils. I think I have the markers in right now, I might not, but it definitely has the journal in there. It has my pencil and it has my favorite erasers the sticky tack. Yep. And I really appreciate giving me um, the affiliate kickback. It's only a few pennies per product. But um, the really cool thing is, and, and I see what people have bought using my affiliate links. Um, the really fun thing is that your the cookie that it puts in there lasts for 24 hours. So I've had somebody buy a marker and then 10 hours later they go back and buy a computer at Amazon and I got affiliate credit for it. So again, it's only pennies for the product, but it's kind of nice because other things that you purchase also then... Um, get credited to my account. And I use the money to pay for things like notebooks and pencil leads and new erasers because I go through erasers like crazy. Um, I go through paper like crazy. And so that just kind of covers the cost um, along with the camera and you know, microphone and upgrades and that kind of thing. Um, I just, I keep buying new equipment to um, improve the experience. All right, so let's get to coloring. Um, let's see. So at the resource page, there is a link. Um, this is over in my free download library. And I just, I can't figure out a good place to put it. So um, that's where it is for right now with my other free downloads. Um, so that is the worksheet that will be, um, that you can use as you go through tonight. It's really just showing you the colors that we're shooting for. Um, and then also over, on, whoops, also over on my site, I have um, the blend that I'll be using tonight. So um, this was yesterday's, um, like every week I do a new underpainting blend. And so that's what I'll be using tonight is the Shamrock Shock blend, which is based on the same photo reference that we're using tonight. Um, so that recipe is, let's see, it's V06 is the underpaint, and then there's G29 on top of that, and then there's a YG17 and a YG25, and these are the colors that I figured come pretty close. They're not exact matches to what's there in the Shamrock Shock, but it is pretty close. Remember, close is good enough. For photorealism, you don't have to match the color absolutely precisely. It's a myth that you need to look at the photo reference and get that exact color. What we're looking for is something that's comparable in value and something that's comparable in color tone. Well, close is good enough. Um, let's see. Saina is saying she traces the stamp image into a journal using a light pad. Oh, so that's a really good option. So, okay, what I think she's doing, and it's good to share information, is she's getting a single sheet. So she's probably doing this so that she's just got one single sheet. And then she's putting the digital stamp on the light pad with this over the top of it and then tracing that on. And that is real. That's, that's a good method. I like that. All right. So... Got that color blend that we talked about. That's what we're working with. I am just all with the wrong buttons tonight. There we go, there's my face. <laughs> all right, so that photo reference is free from Pixabay and um, the reference is, oh, the link to that is on the reference page. Here it is really big. And I'm just gonna do layers and layers and layers of shamrocks. And I think what I'm gonna do, and normally I draw something all ahead of time. I think what I'm gonna do tonight is just draw and then color, draw and then color. And we'll see how much the paper I can fill in. So there's that photo reference. You'll see it up there in the corner. You can see it on that worksheet a little bit better. I recommend looking at the worksheet on a digital device because then you can 
you know, zoom in a little bit, or you can download it from the link at pixabay.com. Um, I also found, because I was really delighted to find that shamrocks have blossoms. So I'm going to work one blossom in there tonight. And this is the one that I'm going to do. And they're purple. And that purple is what inspired the underpaint for the green. So I'm always looking at the environment that my object is sitting in or growing in. And I borrow those colors from the surrounding area. And so I'm borrowing the the violet or the purple color from the blossoms and I'm going to use that as the underpaint for my green. So that's going to be violet under green. Now violet and green are not direct complements. Um, let me see, grab a color wheel. This one just happens to be close because I was messing around with it today. Um, and the nice thing about this one is it's also available over in the free download area where the where tonight's worksheet is. So you can also download this and um, print it out. And um, I laminate it so that the color looks a little bit better. I'll be teaching how to use this wheel in a couple of weeks in the weekly newsletter. Um, okay, so if I point, here's the Violet family. I've got all the Copic families on there. And you notice the Copic families are not evenly spaced. Um, it's a myth that the Copic families are exactly the pie parts on a color wheel, they're a little bit close to each other. See how close blue, violet, and violet are? The purple family is actually over here. There's a difference between violet and purple. Um, so the purple family is in between the violet and the red, red violet. As your markers are lettered and numbered though, that V family is so small, some of them are violet. That's a cooler, more blue color and then some of them like the v06 or the v0 family these are more towards purple they lean a little bit towards pink violet leans towards blue and purple leans towards um, the pinks and the reds so it's warmer um so okay let's point just point the arrow there to in the purple family and when we go over to the opposite side we are kind of coming out in the green family but actually I'm going to be using more kind of yellow green and indirect complements are absolutely fine you don't have to go directly across the wheel it still works so if I'm pointing that arrow towards purple anything in this whole general area is going to work pretty well as an underpaint now yellow universally stinks as an underpaint. It works in watercolor. It doesn't work in Copic. So I wouldn't go too far over, but if you wanted to choose, um, if you're underpainting a purple, then you can use maybe any of these colors and then vice versa. If we're underpainting those green shamrock leaves, we can do anything kind of in this area. So you could underpaint with red. You could underpaint with something red violet. You could do something purple in here something in the um, true violet family, or you could even do a blue violet because anything in this general range is going to work. It's a myth that color theory has to be exact and precise. I'm almost never exact and precise because I almost never consult a color wheel when I'm looking at it. I just know from experience what's kind of on the opposite side of the wheel and I start choosing from colors there. And when the blossom just happens to be in the opposite side family that works out pretty well all right remember i have some a non-porous surface between the paper that i'm working on and the next sheet and that's for two reasons one it acts as a sheet protector because there's last month's project and you can see how much it bled through and then there's the month before that and you can see how much that bled through and there's always a chance that it could bleed through onto the next project but really honestly i don't care if i bleed through because i'll just skip a sheet and i'll use that for testing or something later what i really care about is markers blend better when you're working on a non-absorbent surface so about the worst thing that you can do and this is what a lot of people do is they put a scrap sheet of paper underneath their their coloring paper. And I know you're doing it because you want to protect the desk surface. But what you're doing is you're placing something below that actually speeds up the dry time of your marker. When you have another sheet of paper below your coloring paper, it wicks 
it pulls the solvent through the paper and dries your markers faster. The best blends happen when the ink can stay nice and warm and, or not warm, nice and juicy. And then that way all those little pigment particles, not pigment, colorant, the little colorant particles can move around. They only move around when they're nice and wet and juicy. So putting that non-absorbent surface below my coloring sheet, yes, it protects the paper below, but really I want it there because I want my, my inks to stay wet longer. I've got just a regular corked backed ruler here. I can link to it if you really want to know. I've had this thing for ages. Um, and corked back rulers are the, the ones that you want to use when you are drawing because it elevates the ruler and then when you draw a straight line um, and then you move your ruler, you're not making little drag marks. That elevation is super handy. So an artist ruler, a draftsman ruler, they almost always have that corked back surface to them. Um, and I'm just using this as a straight edge. I'm not really measuring anything, but I just want to come in and give myself some margins. I find that margins are helpful because the natural urge of people is just to color all the way to the outside edge of the paper. And you know you've done it. You feel like you need to cover the whole sheet. Give yourself some margins because there's always a problem when your coloring gets to that outside edge. Like where exactly do you stop it? Do you go over the edge? When you go over the edge with Copic, you get these dark rings around the outside edge of things. So it's not always ideal to um, color all the way out to the edge. Give yourself a margin. And I didn't measure, I'm just giving myself a relative square there. I don't think I'm gonna, um, I don't think I'm going to stop at the square. I plan to have a few petals hanging over the edge, but we'll see how much I can get done while we're here tonight. So there's just that square going around the edge. Oh good, let's see. Um, okay, so uh, Mutna says, I have a silicone mat and it is the same size as the paper I use. Awesome, excellent. Um, when I teach local classes, I have the students use acrylic clipboards. Um, I had one student that used the glass out of a a picture that she got, like a picture frame that she got at the dollar store. And we were a little concerned that the glass might break if she dropped it in the parking lot. So she put contact paper on the back of it. And I think she put some kind of squishy soft cushion on the back of it as well. Um, and she used that for years. So you don't have to spend a ton of money to do it. Um, a placemat will work well. I also happen to have, I really like this thing. Um, what is it called? It's the um, Wendy Vecchi. It's not called Make Art. What is this called? It's a station. Um, and I never use the gridded side because I find that a little distracting to look at while I'm coloring. So I always use the back side. And you can see I've used this quite a bit. There's lots of Copic ink on it. Um, and these are stains. It won't come off. But um, it's metal and it's just a, an all-purpose good traveling surface. <coughs> Whatever you have. Um, I used to, I don't anymore, but I used to have a glass top on my desk and I colored directly on that. That's actually how I discovered that I was, all of a sudden my blends got better and I could not figure out what I was doing differently. Honest to goodness, I had been coloring with markers for 15 years. I got a new desk and my blends were like amazing. And I'm like, what is going on here? What am I doing different? And I'm looking at my technique and I'm watching my hands and I'm wondering if I was overfilling my markers and that might've been giving me a benefit. And then I figured it out. It was the glass desktop that I had just installed and it was slowing down the blends and it was helping things stay wet longer. And when it stays wet longer, you get a better blend out of it. All right, so um, just regular number two lead here in a mechanical pencil. And I am looking, when you see me looking this way right here, I am right now looking at a larger version of that um, flower. It's just off on the side of my monitor in a bigger version because I'm getting blind. All right, so I think what I want to do, 
my general plan. We'll see if this really does happen. I think I want to put a blossom up here somewhere in the left hand corner. And then down here, I want to have one four leaf clover that's kind of like hidden in the picture. Everything else is going to be a three leaf clover or a shamrock. Yeah, shamrock. Um, everything else is going to be three leaves, but there's going to be one lucky one. And I think that would make the most sense to have them kind of opposite of each other. The reason why I'm not doing a lot of, of the blossoms is because I know the blossom is going to, your eye is going to go to a beeline there. Yes, a vinyl placemat, Elisha. Um, that's exactly what this actually is. It's just been cut down. And I used a corner chomper because I kept poking my hand with it. So um, this is just a vinyl placemat. Cheap one. Okay, so my blossoms kind of go here. And I think my four leaf clover there. So the blossom has five petals. One kind of goes that way, one goes that way, and then these two are lower. So the center is more like there. So I'm gonna just kind of draw on what I see there, but if it's not exact, that's fine. And this is gonna have like a little bent edge to it. And then this one also has a bent edge. All right, and then this one is kind of going to come out like so. And I might go a little bit quiet because it's hard to talk and draw at the same time. And there is my little blossom. So I'm going to get rid of these extra stroke lines because if I go over them with the Copic, Copic has just a little bit of shellac in the formula. And that helps to um, adhere it to the paper so that you don't accidentally wipe it off. And um, that shellac um, wrecks havoc with the pencil lead. It kind of bonds that graphite to the paper. I think I'll probably make these a little bit fatter when I'm coloring them in. Yeah, I don't want to putz too much with it right now. Okay, so there's my little blossom. Then I want to pull up the shamrocks. So now I'm looking at the shamrocks and there, I didn't see any four leafers in there. So I kind of need to, to make that up. I'm not drawing a specific one because there isn't one with four petals on it. All right. So each one seems to have like this little, button in the center and then I just see hearts coming out of there out of that center and if you can draw a heart you can definitely draw a shamrock they don't have to be perfect um wonky actually ends up looking more realistic I think I'm gonna have two of the petals kind of overlapping each other and then I'll give myself a nice gap in there. Okay, and then So I just drew a circle and I'm taking those hearts out to the edge of the circle. That's all I'm doing. So there we go. And I think I'm just going to start coloring. All right. So the colors that I see on that blossom, let's go back to that blossom because then I can just kind of 
crank that one out and then put away those markers. So when I was looking at my marker collection, I see V06 on the ends of the petals. I'm not worried about the veins. Um, I'm just looking at the colors of the petal below the veins. So I see V06, but then I kind of talked myself out of it because I thought V06 might be the, the little veins. So I bumped down to a V04. It's still in that same family as the underpaint that we'll be using. So it's all going to make sense with the color sense with each other. Um, so my combination is V04 and V01. And then see where the petal kind of like moves in towards the center and almost looks like it gets white, but that's not white there. It's kind of a cool bluish white. So I, instead of using another V, because at first I thought I would just use a V like a triple zero or a quad zero. Um, but I realized that those look really, really pink. So I'm moving over to a BV quad zero. So that's four zeros because I'm going to get that cooler effect there. And I'm not going to pay attention to the green in the center there. I'll do that with colored pencil. I just want to get the base color in with my markers. So let's try the first one um, and see if that works out. And then if I like the technique, then I'll keep going. Otherwise, I'll modify. All right, so I see the most color up there, and then I see a little bit of color there. And then let's switch to my next color. It's going over the top of that V04, and this is V01 in my hand right now. Going over the top of the V01, or V04, then V01, and now here's that blue-violet. So I'm changing color families. And I'm going to bring that up into the V marker area and just let that blend out. And then I kind of look at it and decide, okay, do I like what I have here? This is what I have while it's drying. Just kind of evaluating. Yeah, I think that's going to work. All right, so this is what I'm going to use. And you know what? I'm going to tighten up a little bit here. Hopefully that's better. Okay, so let's do the rest of the petals. I can crank these out pretty fast. So most of the color on this one is up here. And I'm just going to take that out just a little bit wider. Whoop, wrong marker. Medium color over the top of the darker color. I always color dark to light. Always, always, always. I use less ink and I don't accidentally chase away my darks because the darks are super important for realism. If you find that you've got the one of those projects that just always turns into a... Everything you color turns pastel, it could be because you're coloring light to dark. Because look at what happens when I take this BV Quad Zero up and over. It's lightening that. If I didn't get that dark down first, it wouldn't stick around very long. All right, back down here. See, there's more color on the inside edge there. And then bringing that down. Okay, this one down here has quite a bit of color there. It almost comes right to the edge there. I always look at every petal. I know that there's a lot of tutorials that say, okay, here's how you color a petal. And then you repeat that five or six times, depending on how many petals are on the flower. Um, you'll never get realism that way because every petal has a slightly different coloration to it. 
So it's fine as a shortcut if you're learning, um, but if you're shooting for greater realism in your work, you really do need to color every single petal as if it's a unique personality. Like you wouldn't color all your kids the same. All your petals are slightly different as well. All right, just double checking to make sure there's nothing that I'm missing there in the comments. Um, I do think I'm gonna jump in and do just a little bit of green in the center there, just for fun. I'm gonna go around those stamens. Then I'm going to come back in with the BV0000, there's four zeros there, just kind of chase that green back into place. It's probably not going to budge much, but it will ease the transition there. And that's pretty good. I'm okay with that. All right, so now I can put these markers away because I won't be using these guys again. So just for that one blossom making sure that I get the right cap on the right marker because I've been known to have two different numbers on ends of my markers. All right, let's start coloring some of these um, shamrocks. All right, so this first one is kind of up in the air. I want it to be overlapped by one I don't want to be it to be super obvious. Like this is going to be up above all the other shamrocks, but this one I want to be slightly buried. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to draw another heart. And then eventually I will draw the rest of that shamrock. But for right now, I want it to be overlapped. Okay, so when I look at these shamrocks, I see that they all start from a center point right there where the four hearts or the three hearts converge. That's kind of lower there. And then the petals come up, but every heart kind of has a left and a half, a right fold to it. Kind of see how there's a, there's a fold down the center of each one of those petals, leaves. They're pet okay, these are the petals, these are the leaves. Get your parts straight. All right, so dimensionally, we are placing the underpaint, and I'm just looking at one as a guide, even though it doesn't have four petals there. So dimensionally, I'm getting that underpaint right there where these guys are rising from the center. And the center is lighter, so I'm just gonna hit that with my YG25. And I'm gonna ignore this one for now. Okay, so now I'm gonna take, do I want my darker green there? No, I want this G29 in the background. So I'm gonna start with YG17. And then here's the 25 coming in. blending over those guys. All right, so that's the darker half of that petal. And now I see darkness there, and then this goes light. So that's gonna give us that folded leaf. 
And right now I'm debating, do I want that VO6 under the V17 or maybe I should step it down to the four. I'm going to pull the four over just because that is very obviously purple still. I want something that looks a little shadier and not purplier. All right. go and then I'm seeing there so right now I'm working on dimension I'm working on the shape or the the form the rise and fall of each one of these petals this is dimension There's a little bit over here, but not a lot. Okay. So the, the dimension is how each one of these leaves starts low in the center and rises towards the, the, the edge. And then also the dimension is how each one is folded like a little book. It's the shape that the object takes. Now we're going to do depth. Depth is different. So if you want to keep it straight, dimension is the shape of the object. So we just colored all of these three things for dimensionality. They rise and then they can even dip towards the end. That's why we made that one a little bit darker down there. But this is the dimension, the shape of the leaf. And actually it's a three dimensional shape. So it's the form. Um, depth is different. And depth is, I literally think of it as how far away from my nose is this object? Is it near to me or is it far? Dimension is the form. Depth is near or far. They're not the same thing. And I know that people talk about eye shade for depth and dimension. Well, which one is it? Which one are you doing? Because it's two separate steps. This next petal or this next leaf here, we are now going to work on the depth first, and then we're going to work on the dimension. So this petal, as I've drawn it, and I keep calling it a petal, this leaf as I've drawn it is underneath this other leaf right here. It is farther away, so I'm using underpaint to push that leaf back. I've also drawn it underneath the edge of that leaf. So there we go. There's underpaint there to make it look farther away from my nose when I'm looking at it. I'm always thinking about how far away is this? Which objects are near? This object is near. This object is near. This one is far. So I'm pushing it with the underpaint. Now I'm going to think about dimension. Remember how it sits low and rises and there's a book fold to it. It's two separate steps and I have to think it through if it's going to look accurate, realistic, and dimensional. All right, so that was V04, which is just a little bit milder than what I was using the V06. Sometimes you, you plan to use a color and then you start to use it and you realize you don't love it. All right, so I'm just taking this YG17 and going over the top of that underpaint, and then my flicks are coming out slightly further. I'm going to make sure I've still got that book fold and still got the rise from that center point. So that determines where this leaf gets the underpaint. We underpainted first for depth and then for dimension. So there we go. That is why that one looks farther away. There's more underpaint on it in total because this is closer to my nose and this is closer to my nose and this is going to be closer to my nose. So let's draw the next one and um, from now on I'm going to be doing three hearts.
and this one I'm going to draw it as if there's a little fold over. All right, so let's just do the easy ones, the ones that we're doing dimension only. So it rises from the center, and there's that book fold. Put that center dot in there. I need to clean up my area here so that I'm not moving markers all around. So there's that half of the leaf. Get that blended out. Now, the only thing that I need to be careful of is remember that there's this push right here. So this needs to be a pull. I need to leave this lighter so it's going to appear in front of us. So I don't want to put any underpaint there. And I really don't want to put any YG17 there either. So I'm going to keep that down at the bottom. Get the darkness down at the bottom. And then here's a pull. A pull uses lighter colors. A push uses darker shadier colors not just darker but also shady see how that now looks like it's in front i have pulled this with lightness and i have pushed this with underpaint darkness and this is depth the book fold is the dimension this one sitting on top of the other is the depth all right so now this one's easy here we go just going to look back up and I'm finding another shamrock here and it really doesn't matter which one. And this one has kind of a serious fold to it. I'm going to leave this one nice and bright. It's giving that best chance to blend. All right, so this one, there's a little dimension to it, but it's also got that fold over, which means we've got some depth. So I always use my hands in classes when I'm demonstrating. This right here is going to fold over and curl. So I need to pull the top edge, and I need to push what's underneath. Get that blending ink over everything and see now we've got a little bend to it. All right, let's draw another one. Um, okay, so this next one is going to be super deep in there and this is going to be the center of the next one. We're going to do a lot of depth on this one. So I want to have another one over here and probably another one over here. It doesn't matter that my hearts are not perfect. They're waving in the wind. That one's going to have a little fold on it. Okay, and here's that deep one that I was talking about. I'm going to take this one nice and deep. It's going to be underneath 
all of the others. It's deep into the pile there. I barely see parts of it. Okay, so let's just do one petal at a time. Right there, pushing it below its neighbor. Now let's address the dimension. It's in there, but we got to push it below its neighbor there. So if you're wondering how I figure it out, the answer is I don't figure it out. I let the markers figure it out for me. I need just a little bit more pushing there. So I'm coming back with that purple. And there we go. Just a little bit more darkness in there. So let's let the marker figure it out for me. All right, I know that this is sitting underneath the neighbor. So I push. I'm not trying to calculate it. I'm just pushing. It's underneath the neighbor there. So I'm not planning this out. I'm just looking at what the image is asking for and pushing where it needs to be pushed. So there's all the pushes. And then remember, we still have that dimension where it's low in the center and it rises as it comes out of there. So that's the underpaint for that particular petal. There might be, not be another petal in this whole image that has that same kind of underpaint. I let each one figure itself out. I'm just worried about how far away from it is. From my nose is it? And what is it sitting under? It's all pushes and pulls. And then I take that 17 over the top of the purple as much as I need to cover it over. That one had a lot of purple, so it's going to have a lot of the 17 over the top of it. There's barely any room for the 25, but I will still go over it with a little bit of 25 because if I don't, it won't match everything else in color. Okay, this is an easy one. It's only getting overlapped by the one neighbor, so there's the depth. Now I go back and do the dimension. They all rise from that center point. So at no point am I ever saying, well, this one is gonna have two bright petals and one dark petal. I let it figure itself out based on where it's positioned. And I don't really know how it's gonna turn out until after I figure out the depth first and then figure out the dimension. So Elisha's asking, why don't you use different value marker for dimension to the depth? Um, I could, but to me, it, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm actually using different ratios. So let me pull out my scrap paper. When I'm working on that depth and I want something to be super deep, it probably has a lot of purple to it. And then it probably has a ton, oops, that's the wrong marker. It probably has a ton of that YG17 over the top of it. And there might just be a little bit of the y YG25 showing. So there's a lot of dark stuff there. Meanwhile, this is on a um, depth. Okay, for the dimension, it's only got a little bit of purple, and it's only got a little bit of the dark green going over the top, and then there's a ton of the YG17. So I'm basically using two different ratios of color. I'm using a lot more of the lighter marker um, in this version, and in this version, I'm using a lot more of the darker. So I don't really see a need to switch up my underpaint for that. 
because it's all the same colors working in there anyway. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes when I get a question on the fly there, I haven't worked out the answer yet. That's a good question though. All right, so let's work on this one. It's rather straightforward. There's nothing sitting underneath any other petal. So we're just doing straight dimension on this one. This one is close to us. All right, so, okay. Putting it back oriented like the photo reference. Um, and I'm just gonna pick this one right here. And then and I'm just using the photo reference to get the areas where the dimensional darkness is. And now that I've got that figured out, and blend it out. Some there. Okay, I'm going to finish this one and this one, and then we're going to do some super depth. Get that center. Now remember, there's a push here and a push here, which means the edge there needs to be pulled. I think I want this half to be slightly darker. Yeah, it gives it more of a fold. Okay, so here comes the next one. It's got that fold over. So I've got the pull and the push. I've got the pull and the push. And there's a little fold there. Okay, so we've got some of these spaces in between here that are too small to fit another shamrock into that hole. So what I'm going to do, kitty, strudel, stop. Got 19 things to sharpen your claws on, but they want to sharpen on my chair. Okay, so for the deep, deep, dark areas, because if you look in between, there's like some darkness in there, super dark areas. I have G29 and V09. The first marker that touches white paper, like in this spot, 
is the color that that area is going to want to be. So I hit it with green first. Then I hit it with the purple. And then I hit it with the green again, which restores some of the green. Copic doesn't make a mark a green marker this dark. So what we call this in my classes is a pseudo black. It's not quite black and this actually is darker than a Copic black. There we go. That's the depth in there. Uh, let's see. Mel is asking, do I have a link for what I use to chomp the corners? Um, I can put one in there, but I, I will have to look and see if they even still make this. I don't know. I don't, like I said, I don't do a lot of cra scrapbooking. It's a crocodile corner chomper. And you turn down the corners and then you put the paper or the vinyl mat in there and then you click it. So I'll have to look for a link to that. I'll leave it out so I remember. Okay, so I'm planning out what to do next. I colored in the only ones that are bounded. See, I don't know how far out to take that black. So let's just put another one in here. And this is going to be a deep one because it's going to be underneath the flower. And it's going to be probably underneath its neighbors here. And I'm not going to do anything fancy with this one. I'm just getting the heart shape in there. There's no point in putting like a rollover when it's this deep in there. All right, so let's think about these pushes. It's underneath that petal so flick down it's underneath this one flick down so there's the depth now the dimension is that book fold and the rise from the center And even though it's deep in there and I've got most of the space covered, still give it a shot of the YG25. All right, this one is underneath. Got to push it there. I have to push it there. And I have to push it there. It's like a little jigsaw puzzle, figuring it out each time. And honestly, I love this kind of coloring where I just kind of sit there and figure it out. It's almost like Zentangles for me. There's just something kind of satisfying about sitting there and figuring it out. Okay, so it's under here. And now we have just a little bit of room for some dimension coming up that way. I 
And because this is so dark, I'm going to leave that edge nice and bright, almost as if it's rising up towards us. There we go. And now we have some more pseudo blacks to work on. Let's get this little spot in here. Little spot there. So let's keep going. Do, let's do one right here. All right, this is going to be a deep one. All right, so there's an overlap right there. Push it. There's an overlap right there. Push it. Here's that green center. And some dimension coming out of the center. 17 goes over the top of the purple and slightly beyond. Pretty much fills in the space, but we're still going to hit it with that blending coat. It really does make a difference if you don't do that blending coat. Pushing it right there. And just a little bit of dimension. That's where the overlap is. Flicking out from there. I need to stop doing these so small. I need to make them bigger. When I redraw it for your stamp, I'll make them all bigger. You know what? I stopped drawing my guide circles. That's my problem. Super push. There we go. See, it's starting to take shape. But look, they got smaller. I need to get them bigger. Okay, I'm gonna do a big one. All right, so it's gonna be from here. It's gonna be come out about that far. So uh, let's see, is pseudo black only made with those three colors? So I am just using two colors, actually. It is, I'm hitting it first with G29, then I'm hitting it with V09, and then I'm hitting it again with the same G29. So it's just two colors. And pseudo black can be made with a ton of different colors. Um, they're usually, 
um, not quite compliments, but a little bit off. But you can do pseudo blacks with blues and oranges. You can do them. Um, gosh, there's lots of combinations. And it almost always involves level nine markers. I also like to put um, blue markers underneath E markers to get darker browns than what Copic makes. The blue, not everything works great underneath an E marker. It just depends on which E marker you're working with. But blue is almost like one of those universal shade colors. But basically a pseudo black is it can be made with anything um, dark as long as you're just building up the color to create something that looks dark and murky. It's like super mud. All right, so these two are dimension only because they're not sitting underneath anything. All right, so I want to look at the photo reference. And basically, I'm using the photo reference as just a way to keep myself from repeating the same pattern over and over again. Every single one of those shamrocks in the photo reference has a dark side slightly differently. And this one has like darkness right there. So that's a new pattern that I haven't done before. I am a terrible creature of habit. So if you if you leave it to me to invent a random pattern, it's automatically not going to be random. I just fall into habitual patterns. So quite often I use photo references just to keep me random. All right, so I don't like how big of a space is right there. So I'm just gonna make this up as if there is a little bit of a, a heart peeking up there. Keep it super dark. Pushing it deep under its neighbors. I used to hold all my markers in my opposite hand, like I would do this kind of Wolverine grip, but that hurts to do it with my fingers now. After a long day of coloring, it's really hard for me to hold my markers that way. these pseudo blacks in there. So that was green first and then here's the violet and then a little more green on top of it. <laughs> All right. Let's do a big one here.
Okay, where does it need to be pushed? It needs to get pushed here, pushing for depth. And it needs to get pushed here. And then dimensionally, we got that book fold. Now the green goes over the purple. And then the blending coat comes in, just kind of eases it the whole thing. All right, so there's a push right here. And then I'm going to take that whole half of the petal there, dark. worried about this hole there. <laughs> I keep creating those holes. They're just a little too big, but it's a chance to put something interesting in there, I guess. something like that. super pushes. Okay, pushing for depth. And I'm going to go right over, that's where I dropped my marker earlier. Just going to pretend like it's not even there. So there, these were the pushes. And then there's that dimension. Push it underneath the neighbor and flick outward from that push and then come up here and form the dimension. Cover the underpaint over the top and slightly beyond and then filling in the rest of the space. 
with the blending coat and then the blending coat goes over everything before it. This one is dimension only because it's all off on its own. Just double check in the chat area. And again, I'm creating these really big holes. I don't like that. Okay, so I'm going to clean that up. And now that I'm close to the edge, I want to do a dot right here. And that's about how wide I want it to come out. I'm going to have that one escape the edge, and then this one will not. Yeah, I like that. Okay, pushing for depth. And then dimensionally, I want this one to rise. So I'm gonna let that one, that side fall. Dark green goes over the top of the purple, hides it underneath there. And then the blending coat covers it all. This one, I'm just not even going to bother with it much. I'm just going to take it all dark. Push under the neighbor and flick out from that push. Dimension now. Let's take this side darker. Cover the underpaint. Blending coat over the whole thing. I don't want to forget this one. do a similar one right here.
center dot. All right. Pushing for depth. And honestly, of the two in this project, the depth is the more important one. Because it's the only thing that's going to separate all these green on green on green on green petals. Because they're all the same color. Pushing for depth. Now a little bit of dimension, just darker at the base. A nice bright edge right there. Pushing for depth. And up, and then a nice bright edge right here. Pseudo black in here. Don't want to do the purple first. It'll look a little bit more purple if you do purple, green, purple. And I want this to look deep and green and shady. Not deep and purple and shady. Probably shouldn't have done that one right there because I don't know where if there's going to be a neighbor. I'm trying to get around this and then I will switch to the colored pencils. Okay, so Elisha is adding... Um, or yeah, she's asking, does it matter which side rises and which one falls? Does all the same sides have a fall? No, because when a plant grows, um, it's going to wobble and walk. Like if these are leaves, if my hands are leaves here, you know, sometimes they're going to be like that. And sometimes they might be like that. And then the wind blows and it moves that around. So the more you look at plants, the more you, like in real life, spend some time in your garden, spend some time looking at trees around you. That's a good place to look at leaves. Um, they're in all different directions. Now they might all come from the same center point, which means that there's a fall where they're coming from the stem. But in this case, the individual little petals here, those are all gonna go in different directions. So literally in some of my beginner classes, if we're presented with, like we're coloring the tulip, if we have a leaf on that tulip, I'll tell my students, I literally tell them, just pick a side. If you can't pick a side, have your neighbor choose left or right, because it doesn't matter. Um, unless it's drawn in a particular way, but for, for the most part, stamps are not drawn with leaves in a particular way. And I'm not drawing them in a particular way here.
going to have this be a light gray edge. All right, so we're pushing underneath that flower. There's a little push there. And there's a push underneath this petal. Dimension, almost forgot it. I just chose the left. There was no rhyme or reason for it. The one thing that I do avoid is that I don't always go left. Um, so if I went left on this, on this one, I'm going to go right on this one because I try not to make things look too orderly. Okay, I'm going to cap my super push markers and then I'm just going to come back in just before the colored pencil and do a bunch of super pushes at once with the pseudo blacks. Okay, I'm going to get these guys done and then I'll move on to pencil and then I can come back and finish it at a later point. So pushing for depth, then shaping the dimension. And I'm just always thinking, okay, which petal is closer to my nose? In school, they always said, what's closer to your eye? But it always felt weird to me thinking of one singular eye. And honestly, I think more about where my nose is and where my eyeball is. So that's where the nose thing came from. I'm going to take this one super dark.
Cushing. And now Dimension. Blending coat. I'm going to put a little bit of a push on that because it's really close to there. It's been a while since I've done one with a turn. So do that one with a turn. Pushing. Pushing. A little bit of dimension. push right there. Got to get the dimension in there. I'm just going to go this side. bit of a fold. Okay, cap these guys, and then I'm just going to fill in the depth there. I plan to make these a lot bigger, and so I thought I was going to fill in the space faster than what I actually ended up doing. But when I sit down and um, redraw and improve this image, as a digital stamp for you. I will fill in some of these holes better and have a more consistent size leaf. A lot of pressure to draw live. <laughs> So I'm using um, 
G29 right here. And um, looking for my purple. G29 is a very friendly blender. It's nice and dark. It gives you that kind of foresty green color. Um, there is a marker right next to it, G28, which I would avoid that one like the plague. Um, we call it Satan's Spit because it doesn't want to blend with anybody. It doesn't even want to blend with G29. So um, they're almost the same exact color, but the formulation on the two markers is totally different. G28 doesn't fit into the family. So if you're looking at that one thinking, oh, there's a nice dark green marker to use. No, don't use that one. It honestly is the most stubborn Copic uh, marker that they make. And I didn't realize that it was that much of a problem until I taught a class with it. And... Um, I mean, I noticed as I was coloring with it, because I was using it because I wanted that particular green color, and I don't think I owned G29 at that point, because the two colors were so close that I didn't buy them both. Um, and honest to goodness, it was a class of um, upper intermediates, and I felt so bad, because they just sat there, and, uh, and one woman almost cried with it, because she was just having such a hard time getting it to blend. So then I went home and I really, I went home because I was teaching at, went home with a G29 because I was teaching at a store. So I bought the 29 because I thought I can't use this 28 again. And so then I really started playing with the two markers and I'm, it's like they were just, they're from two totally different worlds. Let me just get these last little holes here. And actually the big holes aren't gonna be a problem. I was trying to avoid making too many of the big ones, but you'll see how I deal with them. And even though I'm doing this with shamrocks, um, I have a couple of classes that, or um, they might be kits, that are similar. So I've got like a kit that's called Apple Blossom, where we do almost the same exact thing, only we're doing it with um, leaves and a pseudo black background, and then um, cute little pink apple blossoms. I know I've done it for a couple of things before, and I've even done shamrocks before. But it's a good exercise for just practicing the pushes and the pulls and focusing on depth, because most of the time when we're coloring, we're focused on the dimension. We're worried about making the head rounded, the, the, the petals bent. We focus on dimension a lot when actually depth is often more effective and more interesting to look at. All right, so I did pull the um, Durant Light Fast Purple, which is what I use in place of Prismacolor Purple, which turns pink if you're not careful. So I have a purple to match my purple markers. Um, I'm trying to decide, do I want to use cream here on the edges of those shamrock leaves? Or do I want to use something like the sage here? I'm looking at the photo and it looks more yellowy to me. So I'm going to use cream. Cream is number number 914. All right. I'm going to pull out. This is Prussian green. Yep, 109. That's my just in case color. Oh, 
Um, hmm. Do I want lime peel or do I want, I think I want this apple green color, I think is what it is. What is that? Spring green. Yeah, that's probably what I want. Um, indigo. Indigo must be in my mug here. Yep, indigo blue 901. Oh, and I need just a bit of yellow. So what is this? Canary yellow. I'm just using it. If you got a yellow Copic, you can pop that in there. Oh, and I need something VO6-ish for the petals, the um, veins on the petals. Mulberry. Mulberry is number 995. All right. To sharpen my pencil. I'm using this indigo. If it looks blue, you're pressing too hard. It just needs to look like transparent pencil. So if you use it lightly, it can just pull out the round edges there. Oh, Nancy. She just said she stopped at Blick today to pick up the Derwent Purple. That sounds so luxurious. I just stopped at Blick. <laughs> I think my nearest Dick Blick might be in... Oh, I don't even know if the Dearborn store is still open. I... It's a good hour and a half away from me. <laughs> I've actually never been to a Dick Blick in, per in person. Okay, so what Nancy is talking about is... Um, yeah, the Prismacolor, if you, um, it's a gorgeous purple. I love to work with it, but it's dangerous. If you get something like this cream pencil too close to dir to the, to the um, Prismacolor purple, this will turn hot pink. It absorbs like this weird kind of oil from the surface that's been colored dark purple. See, I'm just kind of getting those stamens. I'm going to switch to the, this is Prussian green number 109. It is also transparent color. It just so happens to match the green though. Um, so it's a little bit safer. I can use this with a little bit more pressure to drive that a little bit deeper. So here's that Derwent Lightfast Purple. And I'm not using it because it's Lightfast. I'm using it because of the color. Copics aren't Lightfast, so there's no point in paying extra for a Lightfast pencil. Can I put the picture of the flower up to see? Good idea. There we go. So what I was doing is I was spending some time carving this little bits of depth in here and you notice I was doing purple pencils and green a little bit of blue so it's almost creating a bit of a pseudo black right there just around the stamens right there now I want to separate make these petals separate. Don't want them to run together. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to sharpen this pencil because even though it looks sharp, it's been broken off at the point. So I'm giving myself a slight edge. See how far I'm holding the pencil away? I think the biggest mistake that a lot of people make with their colored pencil is they try and color from writing position. So, oh, got purple ink on my finger. If, um, if you're writing your name, if you're, well, we don't write checks anymore. That used to be my example. If you're signing your taxes, you're going to hold the pencil very close to the point. But for coloring, you need to be back. over two and a half inches away from the point of the pencil. And that's how I get these soft, soft, seamless edges. First of all, I'm going in circles, so I'm using that lamb's willing technique. But also, I'm pulled back so I can't physically press hard from this far away. And I also don't think that people sharpen their pencil enough. You let it go dull. And there's like this, um, it's a common belief that if you let the pencil go dull, you'll be able to color softer. And I think just the reverse is true. Because what happens when I let my pencil go dull is suddenly I don't have much control because you can't see where the point is on a dull pencil. And so you go to make a mark and it doesn't quite go where you want it to go. So then you correct it. And every time you correct it, your line gets fatter and fatter. And then you get frustrated. So then you start pressing harder. And so it's like this series of dominoes that all starts with not sharpening your pencil enough. And I know it hurts to spend a lot of money on art supplies and you want to make those pencils last as long as possible. But if you're getting bad coloring results by not sharpening your pencil, then you're not really, I mean, you're saving money, but at what cost? So I'm starting at the stamens because when you start a stroke, it'll always be firmer than when you end a stroke. So I start inside the flower where I know it's okay to have a little bit more pressure. And then I move towards the end. And I try, if you leave me to my own devices, I will make a whole bunch of Y's. So I try and rotate my pencil and I only let myself do a few Y shapes. The Y's are fun. And there we go. Mine's a little bit pinker, but the mulberry is a little bit pinker. Prismacolor is terrible. They've got lots of really good dark purples and violets, um, but they don't have a lot of mediums. So I always end up with this mulberry pencil and then things are a little bit pinker than I originally wanted them, but it's better than um, using too light of a pencil. So I think I'm going to leave that for now. I'm good with that. And I like that, you know, the petals are very light here and very potent towards the end. I'm pretty good with that. 
Alrighty, let's do some of these shamrocks now. I've got that Derwent purple. It doesn't have a number. I hate that they don't have numbers because I'd love to be very precise and say that this is purple number 259, but it's not. It's just purple. It really bothers me when companies don't give us the numbers. So I'm pushing this one deeper. It really sits deep in the pile there. And I'm giving myself a good amount of distance between these front ones and this back one. And I just started here. It's just the first thing that hopped out at me was that these aren't dark enough. And then there's a bit of a push. Softly buffing that away. Okay, so this is logical, but I'm gonna say it anyway. For every push, there is a pull. So I just pushed all of that deeper, which means now I'm gonna pull this edge, and this isn't sharp enough. And I know it's not sharp enough because it didn't go where I wanted it to go. So now I'm gonna pull that edge right there. And now I'm going to pull that edge. There's the push. Here's the pull. So I've got push and push there, and I'm just going to pull this edge right here. I'm going to pull that purple back just a bit. Now, one thing that I noticed in the photo reference is that these aren't perfect little hearts. There's like this little divot. It's a little cut in each one of those hearts, right where the two lobes come in. And that was a feature I definitely wanted to add when I was looking at this ahead of time. Okay, so there's a push. And I'm using the pencil um, to clean up some of my marker edges because marker is a wet medium. And whenever you have a wet medium, the corners, like where this black comes in here, I need to point those edges, those little corners just cleaning it up because a wet marker can never give me sharp corners. For 
every push, there's a pull. And there's going to be a pull right there. And I'm going to take that pull right down there. So as I was looking through the different varieties of shamrocks, when I was looking for photo references, I noticed that there's even um, shamrocks that have little bits of purple in them. Some of them actually have full purple leaves to them. And those were quite pretty. So look around for other possible photo references, especially if you're a purple person, because um, you're going to be quite delighted with some of the shamrock varieties out there. There were some that even, and I'll do it to this one right here, even have like a little band of purple going around. I kind of like that. And I know it's weird. This is purple over green, which to some of you just sounds so alien and foreign, but it works. And it's creating the kind of muddy color that you can't get from doing green on green on green. I pop a little pull on those centers there. Okay, so I had some other pencils out here. I used the mulberry on the flower. Um, if you're chicken to use the purple, indigo blue can come in handy. So let me do this one with indigo blue. I would never like switch back and forth, but let me just show you to demonstrate how the indigo blue is another transparent pencil and it can be used for pushes. It's not as strong though. So if you're chicken and this is your first time and you just, your brain is rebelling at the purple, you can use the indigo blue. I have the Prismacolor um, Prussian Green here. This is another magic color. So if you find that you're heavy handed and you wanna do some of those pushes with green, I would recommend the purple or the blue, but you can do the green if you want. Or if you need to clean up these edges where we're seeing a full edge like hanging out here, the Prussian green is a wonderful pencil to have. Um, I use a ton of this. Very rarely do I use it on green like we're doing here. And then I have this um, spring green here color and I chose it because of, see, notice that the paint here is different than the um, lead there because the paint isn't always accurate on these older pencils. You can tell this is a really old pencil. I don't use spring green a lot, but when I'm choosing pencils, I look at the leads, not the um, barrels. So we've got these areas of darkness here, and I know that it's not just like black dirt under there.
Now I've got two little petals in there, buried deep, so I can break up those bigger areas. And I can really make this look lush and dense just by adding, all I'm doing is just like the edge of the heart shapes. Let's see how that fills in the darkness. And I can put a little bit of this purple pencil because this is technically a pull, we're pulling it forward. Then I can push around it. So see how I'm filling in the depths just by this funny little spring green color. It works because it's an opaque color. So it stands out against the blackness. And just here in this one lesson is it perfectly encapsulates why I'm always telling students that it's not enough just to match the color of the pencil. You really need to know whether you're dealing with an opaque pencil like these guys, they're going to show up over black. Or if you're working with what I call those magic transparent pencils, because we use them for different things. Often I'm not using the pencil for the color. I'm using it because it's a dark transparent. And if you don't know the which which of your pencils are opaque or which ones are transparent i really do recommend pulling out a sheet of black paper and i always have scrap black paper by my side a transparent pencil when you color over the top of black this is a little bit more opaque you can kind of see that color but for the most part you're just not going to be able to see it very well over the black paper. Meanwhile, these two guys, look at that, it practically glows on black. So I would put some washi tape. Maybe you just mark your opaques or maybe you just mark your transparents, but you need to know whether you're working with Prismacolor or any other brand, you need to know whether you're working with an opaque or a transparent pencil. And it just takes the black paper to figure it out. Okay, I'm going to keep moving here. There's a push. And this already pops so much that I really don't need to add a white edge to it. Now tilt that down a bit. Have it really tuck under there. Yeah, I like that. 
So you can adjust the depth with the pencils. I want to make it seem like it's turning down into the darkness so I can almost lose this edge here. So if you have questions, you can throw them over there in the sidebar because I'm really just playing here. This part is just pure fun. I do want to be careful that if I've pulled something, I don't want to take a push color over the top of it because you're kind of um, countermanding the decision that you made before. You already decided it was deep, so you're not going to try and pull it to make it look closer. pull and a pull there. And I find it easier to go through and look for the pushes and do those and then do the pull afterwards. Thanks for scaring me, Finn. So when I do one of these live streams, I reserve the next day to work on the digital stamp. So it should be up, crossing my fingers, by Thursday. There's a community tab here at YouTube on my YouTube page there. And I'll definitely post a notice there that the stamp is available and um, give you a link to where to go get it. 
but I sell all of my digital stamps at sketch slash, where is it slash? It's minus sign, um, sketchgarden.com. So that's where the um, digital stamps that I create from these live streams, they'll always be sold there. Not everything there has a video that goes with it. Sometimes I just have a drawing sitting around that I quickly scan it in and get it up there. So just working it through. Checking the comments over there. Making sure that I'm not missing a question. Because I'll answer other coloring related questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the shamrocks. What was I thinking there? I don't know. I actually thought I would be using the indigo a little bit more than I actually am. So... The indigo is a push. Um, it's just a cooler push. And this warmer push here is working quite nicely. So as long as it's working, I'm not going to mess around. So what you're seeing here is why I usually, or I always, I, there's no usual about it, I always combine markers with colored pencil because I have so much more control over the colored pencil. It's a fine, narrow point. And frankly, the colored pencils are cheaper than one colored pencil is cheaper than a Copic. So I can get a lot more colors into my coloring with fewer markers by incorporating those pencils. It's a little bit ironic that I end up teaching marker classes now because I did not like markers in school. And I didn't like markers in school because at that point we only had um, the chisel nibs. The only pencil or the only marker that came with a bullet point, we didn't even have brush nibs in the 80s. Um, the only one that came with a point that I remember was a black and that was a lettering marker. Um, so I just, I hated markers because they were big and juicy and broad and um, really hard to control. So I always ended up putting colored pencil details over the top of the assignments that had to be marker for marker classes.
when I'm doing this little purple stripey band, I'm kind of doing like that kind of a stroke because I want it to seem very generic or uh, organic. I don't want it to seem too planned. Donna says, this would be a fun project when I travel. Minimal supplies, stunning results. Yay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is something that I could easily see doing. We go camping a lot. So yeah, you can just, I mean, really total, if it wasn't for that blossom, this would be five markers. The blossom adds another three markers. And then I'm really basically just... I've used four pencils in depth and then I've got these two sitting by the side, but I could have, I could have done without these two. So yeah, very minimal supply list. So there's that kind of scribbly stroke that just keeps it looking because like if I did this, that doesn't look very real, does it? I don't want to do it too hard. But this looks a lot more real than this one. This scribbly kind of stroke. And I'm not worried about directional lighting. Yes, the flower had some directional lighting to it, but it's not like I was mapping out the lights coming from this direction or that direction. I'm just thinking about which edges of the leaf are tilted upward catching the sun. Whenever you're using um, white or cream, some of those high white content pencils, um, the ones that are very opaque, it's normal to feel like you're pressing a little harder. You have to press a little bit harder to get them to stick to the paper. Especially if you're using a good marker paper. So it, you can get a little bit of colored pencil to stick to something like Express It, but it really is like trying to nail jello to a tree. You're just only going to get so much of it to stick. Um, so you have to press a little bit harder just to kind of push it down into the paper. That was one of my qualifications for finding a journal like this was that it had to take more pencil more easily than say the Express It does. I don't work in journals a lot. I do so much drawing and coloring for classes that I find that I don't do like the sketch a day kind of thing. I keep telling myself I should get back into that habit, but it feels like homework to me because that was always assigned. Um, I had one class that we had to do, um, it was 30 drawings a week and it was just, it was tedious. It made me hate drawing quite a bit. I mean, the results were good, but I didn't look forward to doing it. And so I've never really carried that journal habit because I'm so busy drawing and coloring regular projects. 
So now that I've found a pretty good journal, maybe I'll start drawing a little bit more for fun. But honestly, when I go on vacation or something, last thing I want to do is work. That is the worst thing about making your passion your career. Is that you do lose some of the, the moments for joy doing it. But that's my problem, and you get to reap all the benefits of that. Now, an opaque colored pencil is not so strong that you can make serious corrections on something dark. They're not fully opaque. But you can use them to adjust the depth if something feels wrong. And that's really about all I need them for cleaning up the edges and adjusting the depth. So I'm just cooking away at it. Do I have in-person classes? And if so, where do we find information? Um, prior to COVID, I did used to teach locally in Southeastern Michigan. And I have run remote retreats before, but it's very hard to turn a profit on them when I have to fly to something. Um, so what we've done is I've purchased, we've purchased here this house I was not living in a few years ago. This is a new house to us. It does have a um, pole barn that we will be turning into a teaching studio. Um, it's just a matter of saving money to be able to afford that construction process. So I will be teaching again in person in the future, but I am not right now. So everything is online and it's kind of funny that when I was teaching locally, mostly people were upset that I didn't teach online enough. And now that I'm teaching online, people want the local classes. <laughs> And I have um, thought about renting space or finding a, a new store. The store that I used to teach at is now too far. I've moved an hour away from a store that was originally out an hour away. So um, I'm teaching too, or I'm living too far from that original store to continue teaching there. It's just too much of a drive. Especially, I mean, there were times when you drive all the way out there and you'd have 20 people RSVP'd for a class and then only six would show up and you don't get paid for the, the bulk of the people that didn't show up. So teaching in person really is, um, it takes up a lot of time to do. And so I'm just really focusing on the online stuff right now to be able to do it on my own timeline and charge what I want for the classes. And then eventually I will get that studio up and running. We have, it already has heat, so we're, we're that far. Um, but we want to build a kitchen out there so that people can um, take a break. And we need to put in a handicapped bathroom. And then um, right now the walls are unfinished as is the ceiling. So there's just some some things that we need to get done before it's habit habitable. And I want to have one of those mirrors that's up above the desk 
so that people can look down on what I'm doing, but then also look at a monitor to see what I'm doing from your own desk. So the plans are all drawn up. We are making headway on it. It's just, it's a work in progress. Yeah, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa has been waiting for the art barn. She was, Lisa was with me when I was, we were real estate shopping and she looked at more than her fair share of barns because I would send her links. What do you think of this? What do you think of this? All right, so Nancy is asking, is there a way to correct if you get too heavy handed with the purple? Okay, so I typically use three different types of erasers. Um, let me grab all three of them. Where's my third kind? Okay. So just like a doctor, I work under the um, rule, first do no harm. So the lightest of my erasers is the sticky tack, and it's literally poster putty. I know it's gray, it kind of looks gray, but that's because it's dingy. It started out as white poster putty. And I do recommend the white poster putty, not the colored poster putty. Like there's a couple of brands that are blue, um, they don't work as well. And those gray kneaded erasers do not work for colored pencil. They're designed for loose pencil without a binder to it. So graphite or pastel pencil. Colored pencil has a lot of wax in it. So those kneaded erasers are not strong enough. So what I've been doing here is kneading this little piece of sticky tack here. So this is actually stickier than a kneaded eraser. So that is, um, you have to warm it up and then I tend to, like I will run it on paper to give myself kind of a little triangular point to it. And then you don't rub back and forth. What you do, so let me just work on, let's say I didn't want to push that. I did want to put, I, I, the push isn't wrong. Let's just say I wanted to lift it up. So you use it the same way that you would use, um, remember Silly Putty when you were growing up? So I'm just pressing it in there and it's lifting up anything that is not embedded too deeply into the paper fibers. It's not damaging the paper fibers either because that's the worst thing about when you use one of those... Um, pink erasers that's on the end of a regular pencil. I don't even have one nearby here. Oh, here it is to show you. Um, one of these pink erasers actually has pumice in the formula here. And that's what helps to remove the graphite on the paper. By damaging the tooth, it can help you remove the graphite. And you don't want to damage the tooth because then when you come back with the right color of colored pencil, you're not going to be able to get the pencil to stick because you've damaged the tooth. So you can hear it that I'm like pulling up color and that's why this gets gray after a while. If that doesn't work, then you can move to the next strongest type of eraser. I really like these mono zero pencils because, or pencil erasers, because that's a super fine point on there. See how tiny that eraser is? It's the same kind of eraser that is on the polymer erasers. It's just in this little teeny tiny point. So this is the next strongest eraser. It still doesn't have any pumice in the formula. There's no grit to it, but it will lift a little bit more than this will. But at the same time, because I am physically rubbing, I am now going to be damaging those paper fibers. So if I can get it up with the sticky tack, I will. But if I can't, then the next thing is to come in and try with the white eraser. 
Now, the thing that people don't realize about white erasers and colored pencils is to remember that colored pencils are waxy. So the end of your white eraser here is going to start getting discolored after a while. And I just rub it on my blue jeans. It'll come out in the wash. It doesn't make a mark that you can see, but you're physically just kind of scrubbing the end of the eraser clean and then you can come back in and do a little bit more. But what I wouldn't want to do is come over here and take the wax that I've lifted from over here and transfer it someplace else. So that's why you want to make sure that your white eraser stays clean. Now let's say you've made, <clears throat> you get a drink here. Let's say you've made the mother of all mistakes and you just really need to get this lifted up. The next eraser that I use then would be a black eraser. Now you have to be careful about the brand that you use. This is Sakura. This is a Sumo Grip and it has just a little bit of grit to it. But there is one called a Black Pearl that's made by Pentel that that thing is the devil. You do not want to use that because it has more grit than this does. So you can't just say black eraser. Amy said all black erasers are good. You need one that is a polymer black eraser. And it does now I've heard people say that black erasers are for erasing on black paper. Um, oh, oh, okay. But I've always used it on white paper. It doesn't leave a black mark. So you don't have to worry about that. This just has a little bit more grit than this would. Now my favorite format for this sumo grip is this click version which has been discontinued so I love it I would love to recommend it to you but I can't find these anywhere I really wish I could because it just it's a see how it, it's a click eraser I, I love this thing I don't know why they discontinued it um I don't have as much control over this but this would be the last resort and because this has a little bit of grit to it, it will lift up, I would say, 95% of the colored pencil there. And now this is pretty much clean. The tooth is not too damaged. The more you use this, the more you're going to damage it. But I've started over, basically. And now I can come back in. If you use the wrong color, you can correct the color. Or you can just, you know, start over again and hope next time that you use less pressure. But that's the levels of eraser that I use. So the first one, start with that, the sticky tack. Second would be a polymer white eraser. And then the third is the polymer black, which has just a little bit of grit to it. And that got me back to white, so or not white, but back to the original green. It removed everything except what's in that little teeny tiny crevice there. So now I got to put it back because it was right. And I miss it now that it's gone. But it is not an uncommon problem to accidentally put, especially as a beginner, to accidentally put down too much color. Colored pencil is not for everyone. It's a very slow medium and it requires you to be patient and it takes just a little while to develop a light touch but once it's like riding a bicycle though once you learn how to do that light touch you'll never forget it you'll have a hard time pressing hard once you master it so it is worth it and everybody does eventually catch on I've never seen anybody totally fail for a lifetime of colored pencil and it's so much easier to travel with your colored pencils than it is to travel with a bunch of Copic markers. I mean, it's just, it's so much more portable. All right, so it is 9.30 my time and I am basically repeating myself here, just going over the same thing. I will probably continue this um, and then tomorrow I will redraw it after I've finished it. So I will post photos, um, probably, 
probably to Facebook, but I'll try and post it here to the community tab um, inside YouTube. I'm trying to remember that that's there and use it more. You know what? I haven't done any of those little folds. I only did two or three of them. So here's an area where, remember, there's that fold, that turnover. Okay, so I have to think this through. I've got this little interior thing here, but then that scrubby is going to start there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Get that little scrubby stroke in there. And then the pull is right there. Cream, I use almost as much as I use um, white Prismacolor. The difference is, and I almost always use the cream on green leaves, um, because when you use white, it is such a cool white that it has a tendency to look a little bit blue. So I find that the cream just works better it's closer to green. Yellow is closer to green. So I end up using cream mostly on leaves. Other objects I will use a white Prismacolor as the highlight, um, but not usually on leaves. All right. I think I've... We haven't finished that one. Started this one. Yeah. I think this is going to be a good stamp. It'll be fun to color. And you know what? I was just drawing hearts. So you could totally try doing that yourself and follow the same method that I used where, remember, you're just... You're just drawing that starting point, that, that center point, and then give yourself an outer margin. And that, that tells you, that was my problem with these smaller ones. My shamrocks kept getting smaller and smaller because I wasn't establishing that circle. And that's not a perfect circle. It doesn't need to be. And we know that there's going to be three. So you can put the spokes on the pinwheel if you want. And I'm just drawing very lightly. Don't draw hard, because that's hard to erase. Three little hearts. And if it's a wonky heart, that's even better, because it makes it look like it's twisty. And then you can come in and erase the lines that you're not using. Erase the guidelines. Drawing the blossoms a little bit more difficult, but drawing is not a difficult skill. And if you're brave enough, you can jump in and do it. Oh, this is that um, four leaf clover. And it's just going to be hiding in there. So some people may see it and some people may not. I used to draw little tree frogs in things that um, I have not done that in a good 20 years, but I used to do it a lot. So whenever my dad would look at any of my artwork, he was always looking, where's the tree frog? And it wasn't that I loved frogs. It was just, it's an easy animal to tuck into places.
And that's actually why I have the tree frog classes, because I got really good at drawing tree frogs. Okay, folks, I think we're going to call it an evening. Let me just scan the sidebar there for any questions that I may have missed. But I think I got most of them. Yeah, I definitely did. Okay, great. I'm glad that I covered questions that people have. Um, you can always catch me over there at Facebook. Um, it's Vanilla Arts Chat is the open forum where we just you can ask questions and we talk about um, uh, your projects or you can ask for feedback on things there's a lot of really good people over there really smart people um, who have taken my classes and they're always quick with an answer when i can't be and um, you must answer the questions to join it's just the minimum um, minimum amount of things that I do for admission to it um, but you're welcome to join and you can post pictures of your clover when you color it and in the meantime I have Valentine's Day is tomorrow so we got lots of practice drawing hearts here um, yeah all right so have a great evening everybody thank you for joining me for this project I'll be posting um, the finished version um, probably late tomorrow afternoon. So looking forward to that and talking with you about drawing your shamrocks. All right. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye.